Hey, boys and girls, welcome to today's episode on this Panerai Pam 00372. It's quite a mouthful, so I'm just gonna call it a 372. It's hard for a new Panerai to be taken seriously in today's world. There's no hype around it, it's not that flashy, it's just sort of a big chunky watch with fame from yesteryear. I was getting into the watch hobby at the tail of the Panerai craze. I knew about the brand, and I have heard people talking enthusiastically about it. Still, I wasn't into it at all. I was aware of the community around the brand, but every time I saw someone wearing a Panerai, it just felt like the person wanted the world to know that he's wearing an expensive watch. Expensive it was, but I thought it was for people who couldn't afford the real high-end watches and settle for the lesser. Suffice to say, I never would want to wear anything from the brand. As a young guy who likes watches, I, w I was just getting started. I like vintage Rolex and the bubble backs. I like small, complicated watches from Universal Geneve and Patek, of course. You can see a pattern there. I did not want to wear big watches. I don't have the wrist for it, nor the appetite. With wrist size staying the same, with much of the world changed. Last year, I decided to purchase my first Panerai. It was a frustrating moment. Not because I bought the watch, because the current status of our watch world. I was feeling odd with the seemingly price of every watch jumps every week. I did not want to play that game. I know it could be inflation, it could be the market, or just a small group of people pushing something up, whatever. I'm not going to get something that everyone cares about anyways, because if I were to do that, I wouldn't have learned something new. I've had the 5711 when they were under retail, I had Royal Oaks when they were the trash modern watches that one cares about. I'm good. I thought to myself, let me try this brand, the Panerai that I absolutely did not like to say the least, and maybe, just maybe I'll like it. Worst case scenario, I'll lose a bit of money buying it, but which one? Panerai was the hottest thing, so I thought, let me dig a bit deeper into its history. Maybe I could figure out why there was that hype around it at the time. Actually, there are different parts of the brand. There was the old Panerai, who made watches for the Italian Navy. It was called the Panerai A Filio, Panerai and Sons. Mr. Giuseppe Panerai was the man behind the brand. He helped Panerai secure partnership and deals with the Italian Navy and the famous Swiss watchmaking brand. After his death, Panerai soon descended into the brink of bankruptcy. The second part, an officer from the Marina Militare called Dino Zay was asked to be in charge of the company. He changed the name of the business to Officine Panerai shortly after. In 1984, the famous OP logo was introduced. Since Panerai heavily depended on the contracts from the Italian Navy, with the government reduced military expenses in the early 90s, the company struggled to generate income. Then, something miraculous happened. A Japanese watch magazine published an article about vintage Panerai in 1992. The title was Rolex Panerai. It caused a big stir in the collector's community. The aforementioned CEO of Panerai, Dino Zay, quickly recognized the market opportunities and started producing watches for civilians. Panerai made some really cool watches at the time. Those had mostly minimalistic designs and were produced in relatively small number. Only around 2,000 pieces of these pre-Vendome watches were sold. We'll go back to that name in a minute. A social lit artist, Monty Shadow, also discovered this opportunity and proposed to sell Panerai watches with celebrities. As a result, the famous actor Stallone received 54 watches from Panerai. Whether or not Stallone has paid for these watches is unknown, but according to several online sources, the actor did not pay. However, he didn't give the brand some proper exposures. His Hollywood friends, including Arnold Schwarzenegger, received Panerai watches as gifts from Stallone. The Vendome luxury group started to take notice of Panerai watches and eventually offered to acquire the brand. That's where the name Pre-Vendome came from. The Panerai watches made before the acquisition were called the Pre-Vendome watches. In 1997, the Vendome group, which was controlled by Richemont, took over Officine Panerai for mere 1.4 million euros. There began the last stage of the brand, which is the Richemont era. So, after a short reading on Panerai history, I decided it's best to get into some of their vintage or pre watches. Those are great watches, but there are two problems. One is the price. The original military-issued Panerais are of course the most authentic and desirable. They are all basically vintage Rolex watches, with the exception of one. They represent real history. 
The Prix Vendôme watches are rare as well, but they are expensive. The price could range from 50 to 100,000 for the ones I like. I'm not comfortable spending that much money on my first Panerais. Secondly, it's the wearability. Vintage Panerais are great to collect, but they usually aren't waterproof anymore. The radium in some of them also isn't something I want to deal with. I'm a rugged, tough, and wearable Panerai for myself. So that eliminated all the pre Vendome and vintage Panerais for me, but what should be my criteria for choose my own Panerai? I did a bit more research and just look at the offerings from Panerai. I then drafted out some features that I do want in my first Panerai. First off, I knew I wanted a sandwich style. A sandwich style is basically a dial with two parts. The lower part of the dial being fully covered with luminescent materials and the upper part drilled out to make the loom visible. Normally a watchmaker just apply luminous materials onto the dial, sort of painting on there. But with sandwich dial, it's big luminous plate hidden underneath. And the light comes out from the hollowed out surfaces in the shape of numerals. That is tremendously cool and different. It's quite efficient too. The sandwich dial shines much, much brighter in comparison to a normal dial. Also the cutouts add a good amount of depth and 3D look to it, which is definitely a bonus. Next, I knew I wanted a similar case shape to a vintage Panerai, specifically the one on the Japanese magazine cover. I know that the wireless version were a bit smaller, which is nice for my wrist, but a regular luminar case with straight lugs and that signature chrome guard is something of an icon. It's a G-Wagon with its boxy shape or 911 with its round headlights. It's also cool to know that this specific case shape is almost like the Panerai 6152-1, which has a Rolex case. I like the fact that the shape is quite square. It was basically a pocket watch that has been modified to have luck. Now that is pretty cool for a vintage nerd. To have the 372 being almost a reissue of the 6152-1, that is a quite a value proposition. The half moon shaped crown guard is instantly recognizable and fun to operate. It keeps the crown in place and really adds more masculine presence to the watch. The movement P3000 is nothing to write home about, but it is a big size movement and it fills the case rather perfectly. I would not like a small movement in such a big case. It's hand wound and has a three day power reserve. It's all rather standard stuff. So it's a perfect starter pen right then. Even got that acrylic crystal, which is common feature on a vintage watch, but rare in modern watches. It could get scratched, but it only adds to the vintage look and feel of the 372. It's not perfect though. The old polish steel case is too shiny for my liking. I wish it's so brush finish, like it's crown guard. That look more proper to watch. I also didn't need to see such a rather plain movement through a sapphire crystal. I love to have that covered up with a nice piece of steel. The OP number and the PAM reference number on the side of the case just gets annoying over time. They seem to be there to remind you that this is just a luxury modern watch instead of a true military diver. The elephant in the room though, I, I save it for the last, is the size of this beast. It is 47 millimeter. Here's a comparison of it next to Rolex bubble bag. You almost can't imagine anyone wearing this watch this large, especially with a skinny wrist like mine. But surprisingly, it's not that bad. The lugs are short, so the watch stays rather nicely on my wrist without looking like a frying pan. It's brilliant when you wear it with a nice vintage leather jacket. It absolutely looks the part. After chatting with a wonderful strap maker for Panerai, I learned that this watch could take some beatings. He took it out on a safari and some kayaking tours. The watch has seen the sea, water, river, and some rocks. Yet without any service, it seemed to do fine. In the increasingly luxurious world of watches, these little machines seem to need more babying by the week. And you can justify the prices of some of them to actually go outdoor with them. I do worry the constant potholes and bumpy rides on my bike would damage the movements. Luckily with this 372, I never did. It looks tough as nail and it surely is. I could take a hit or rain or a swimming session and it would turn out fine. In the end, this might be the watch I will take with me on my adventures. And maybe this no hype and not so complicated Panerai could be the company you would take on yours. Right. 
Thanks for watching today's episode. We'll see you on the next one.